Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. And another heavyweight news and notes mashup video today. Starting with Andy Ruiz and Luis Ortiz were set to face off in a pay-per-view main event September the 4th in the United States. So this will be in Los Angeles. So weirdly they put out a press release saying tickets go on sale. And that was the official announcement a day later, the actual press release with quotes. So I don't know what happened. Maybe there was a mix up. But uh, scrolling past the um, the first bit, which you can see also has a bit of the undercard uh, information, uh, we'll get to Andy Ruiz Jr., who says, I'm so excited to get back in the ring in front of all my fans in Los Angeles on September 4. This is my chance to prove to everyone that I'm going to be heavyweight champion of the world again. I'm super motivated to be facing a great fighter in, like Luis Ortiz, so my fans can expect to see me at my best. Everyone has wanted to see this fight, and we're going to give everyone a war on fight nine. And then we get to uh, Ortiz. So he says... I'm blessed to be back in a position to get closer to achieving my goal of becoming the first heavyweight champion of the world from Cuba. Anyone who doubts me has only fueled me to keep going. I know that I have to make a big statement in this fight, and that's my plan on September 4. I respect Andy Ruiz Jr., but he is standing in my way, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get through him, to go through him, I should say. So those are the quotes uh, from the fighters, September the 4th. And there has been, I've seen some fan sentiment and reaction about it being pay-per-view. But uh, given the current sort of climate, this was probably always going to be on pay-per-view. If Charles Martin, Luis Ortiz, if that's on pay-per-view, this was always going to end up on pay-per-view as well. And uh, there was a couple of people who uh, hit Dan Raphael up on Twitter about that, actually, saying it's not a pay-per-view worthy fight. Fox should get pissed at PBC, always gives them games garbage fox cards and shite pay-per-views and Raphael responds incorrect characterization fox is happy to put it on pay-per-view and reap a distribution fee and not pay license fees fox isn't doing any network fights anymore except maybe some pay-per-view prelims and I've been saying for a while and especially after that Martin and Ortiz card was announced they're trying to cut their cloth and make fans pay for it because obviously at this time with the pandemic and it's still having some effects on fighters heavyweight fighters in particular are fighting less and that's because they're more expensive but if you can basically make um the the fan pay most of the cost and the broadcast is not interested in paying the cost but you make the fan do it directly it kind of works out for uh, pbc and fox so i can understand why they're doing it we don't have to like it but obviously it is something that they're doing at the moment uh, moving on to Alexander Usyk, and this is just something that I wanted to note. So you can see here, this was uh, a couple of photos that was uh, posted on his uh, social media. This was about five days ago or so. And a lot of people have been reading into this and saying Usyk is bulking up, that he's putting on heaps of weight, etc. And I just think that people maybe should pump the brakes on expecting Alexander Usyk to be much heavier in the rematch because I've seen a lot of that sentiment around people saying he's obviously going to come in heavier and go for the knockout. I think Alexander Usyk, a couple of months out from the fight, he's not fight, fight ready yet. He's been training for a while, but I expect to see Usyk roughly about the same weight as he was for the first fight. One of his advantages over Anthony Joshua is that he's uh, quick and nimble, his speed. Why would he want to give that up and become much more hittable and an easier target for Anthony Joshua? It doesn't make any sense to me. So I think people who are saying that he's uh, coming in bulked and going to be bigger, I think we just need to see what happens on the scales at the weigh-in because I'm, I'm not expecting him to be you know, coming in you know, Deontay Wilder-esque putting on 20 pounds from the second to the third fight with Fury. It's not going to be anything like that. Uh, moving on, so you've got Kubrat Pulu, who's uh, fighting Derek Chisora July 9th in London. He has a message for Chisora. We'll play it. Derek. 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 Derek! Derek! 
Do you understand me, Derek? Do you understand me, man? Filip Hergovic, the Croatian heavyweight, training hard in Croatia at the moment. Uh, there is some talk and some chatter that he is going to probably be on the Usyk and Joshua undercard, that they'll look to do that final eliminator with Zhang Zhilei. Uh, obviously, that was meant to happen a few months back, but Hergovic's father died, so he had to pull out of the fight. Zhang Zhilei ended up getting a, a stoppage win in his fight that he had in place of Hergovic pulling out. But yeah, I don't mind that as either a co-main event or uh, maybe third fight on the bill sort of thing. Uh, I know some people won't be too thrilled with it if it ends up being co-main event, but I don't mind it at all. And for Hergovic and Zhang, I think it's an intriguing fight for a number of reasons. And Zhang gave us, with that uh, win over Scott Alexander, just a little reminder, he's got good power. And if Hergovic isn't uh, careful when they do fight and he lands something clean on Hergovic and early it could really change the course of the fight and um, mess Hergovic up. His promoter, though, Kala Sauerland, and this is not of Hergovic, but he's um, not happy that people are, as he says, knocking the opponents of Josh Kelly and Nathan Gorman. Remember, they have been out of the ring since 18 months. It's a massive step back into the limelight since signing for Wasserman Boxing and on the path to the top. Have a little faith and get behind him. See, I guess the problem that I have with some of these comments is on fight night, the way that uh, the commentators, the whole broadcast, Kelly Salwell were car carrying on, and I'm just going to talk of Gorman, not so much Kelly, that uh, Gorman was facing a really credible opponent that was going to put Nathan Gorman back into uh, big fights. And they were absolutely exalting the performance and, you know, really going over the top with what it meant for his career and the what next. So him saying people can't knock it it's like well what do you expect it was a garbage opponent it was largely a garbage card fans are allowed an opinion and you can't have it both ways so you want to say it's a good opponent on fight night but now you're sort of defending and go oh people you know they've been out of the ring for this amount of time gorman's case it's not quite 18 months he was fighting in march last year so yes it's over a year but he's sort of egging it on a little bit so what is it was it a good opponent or was this a tune-up you can't have it both ways, Kala Sauerland. And it was a garbage opponent. But actually, um, after the fight, and I only caught this uh, yesterday, so this was from seconds out, because I had a few people coming to the channel uh, from that Gorman video saying, oh, it'd be good to see him in with Daniel Dubois again. And I was thinking, well, where's this sort of coming from? And it's from Kala Sauerland himself. And it was there were some really strange and bizarre comments because he said that uh, Nathan Gorman has effectively earned that fight and he didn't see any reason why Frank Warren wouldn't want to make that fight. And as I said to a few people in some comments, well, why would Dubois want it? He's been there, done that, got the postcard. What has Nathan Gorman actually done to prove that he's got any better to be competitive in a rematch? Remembering he was schooled and knocked out in less than half the fight. So it is a case that Nathan Gorman was soundly beaten. And is there really any demand for a rematch? Carlos Allen's got to get realistic here. I mean, it was just complete weirdness and bizarre comments saying that he's uh, basically this is a fight we can get done and get made. There shouldn't be a problem doing it. I mean, you're not reading the room in the landscape of the heavyweight division, especially in relation to Nathan Gorman's career. I mean, if this is the sort of comments you're making, thinking it's realistic, I mean, I really have concerns for what's going to happen with Nathan Gorman because it's probably not going to be uh, anything good. Uh, moving on, though, Lucas Brown, he is ramping up his efforts uh, to land a fight with Daniel Dubois. So saying Dubois is very good, don't get me wrong, but I'm not afraid of the man. I definitely come to bang and come to win. I want to win my old title back. It's something I am chasing. Whether he can get it or not, we'll have to see. I mean, as a first defense of Daniel Dubois' so-called world title, which he won from Trevor Bryan, the WBA regular title, uh, it really comes down to, I guess, uh, what sort of money is going to be on the line, because Brown is all about getting the biggest payday at this point. But in terms of what would be considered a relatively safe defense, Brown probably ticks that box. He ha does have power, and he showed as against Junior Far he's still dangerous. But I think Daniel Dubois would think he's got too much uh, for Lucas Brown. And if he clips Brown, Brown is going to sleep.
Moving on, and we're going slightly down the rabbit hole from a couple of post to post to post here, but you've got uh, the Rom football Johnny Fisher, the British prospect, uh, so he now has his degree. So he's picked that up, history degree, but he's now also been called out uh, by journeyman Christopher Lovejoy, who says, we can line it up this fall, USA versus UK. So Lovejoy's been calling out Fisher for some time. And as you can see at the bottom, you've got DeAndre Savage, which is a Lovejoy manager prospect um, and he wants um, Savage to be facing Solomon Dakers. Dakers and Fisher are matchroom prospects. So I don't know if this is going to happen. I mean, Hearn's, Eddie Hearn of Matchrooms tried to get Lovejoy into a fight before and obviously it fell over. That was with Dave Allen. Um, at the time, Lovejoy was still promoted by Don King, got called off due to sort of uh, lawyers getting involved. But could this happen? I mean, if it does, I think Fishing absolutely wrecks um, Lovejoy, who really is a grifter and is after a payday. DeAndre Savage is a little bit more interesting because this guy does have um, some background in the sport as an amateur. And this is where we move on to something else. So he recently fought this past weekend, a little clip here that he's posted to his social media, absolutely uh, dropping that guy like a sack of potatoes off a cliff there. Uh, and then you have him calling out Jeremiah Milton, the American prospect, his fellow American prospect he says dreamland milton you've been real quiet over there your soft ass this is how you do a bum you went six rounds with a bum and i'm knocking them out easy i'll be seeing you soon so in his pursuit of uh, a fight with jeremiah milton they have been sort of back and forth for months now with trash talk and rounding out this heavyweight news and notes uh, mashup video so I don't normally cover uh, too much from uh, guys that are in the amateurs i do follow a number of them but the British um, amateur heavyweight Delicious Ori. So you can see here, and has, as he says, one of those days at the office. So front tooth knocked out from sparring, but he did manage to uh, get it all sorted with a dentist. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's an occupational hazard, that one. But what do you make of it all? Drop a comment loud and often. Hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, boxing underscore squared. I'm out.